So I want to ask you all, uh, one of the hot topics that have been taking place as of late within Montgomery County, specifically within MCPS, is a conversation around school resource officers and whether or not there's a need to have them there. On one side, you have a lot of people who say, yes, we need to have them there to ensure safety for our students. On another side, there's an argument that having them there actually criminalizes typical juvenile behavior and then creates what we call the school to prison pipeline, right? And these unnecessary interactions between young people, right? And law enforcement at a really early age. So I think it's important, once again, if we're talking about the consumers of a service or a product, you all being young people are actually the consumers of this product. How do you feel about having a police officer in your school? That's a great question. I can personally testify, I don't feel safer with one resource officer in a school about 3,000 with multiple exits. Um, a lot of these officers are brought in for restorative practices, um, but I see them as a set of legal eyes. When there's a fight going on, you have the security members jump in, um, and they're the set of legal eyes in case something happens, and that's where you kind of see the school's prison pipeline form in. Um, instead of labeling them as a student, you're now labeling them as a criminal you have an extra set of eyes on them instead of um, disciplining them like a student. Now you're disciplining them legally. Um, and when you look at it, you also have the inequitable disciplinary conducts going on. And how do you make sure that your white students are being disciplined the same way as your color students or even your athletes? People like to say, oh, these are great athletes, but they get away with so much. Um, so going back, to how do I feel about them. I don't feel safe with them. Um, I see them as a pair of legal eyes. And you look in emergency situations, there's an intruder. Um, a lot of people use Parkland as an example, or Sandy Hook, all these mass shootings. But one resource officer isn't going to do it in a large school. Um, you expect them to go to the other side of the building in a, in a flash, when technology has so much more power. Um, I think what we should invest in instead is bettering our security, making sure that all those doors are locked, that there's cameras in every single corner of the school. Because why do you need those set of legal eyes if you have the cameras to look back on? Um, and I wish we saw resource officers that looked more like us. I've never met a woman being a school resource officer. So then you get, when there's a fight, who's inappropriately touching or what was done wrong. Um, our past resource officer, Officer Allen, was awesome. The community knew him. He grew up there. Students had a trust within him. And when there was a change, there was kind of almost racial tensions that were arising. And you need to draw the line of where's your duty and what's right. So I just don't see the need for them. Well, actually, I'd, uh, I'd like to say this is a great question. And I do have a pretty considerably different point of view on it. I think school resource officers are absolutely necessary. And I, I agree that, honestly, there probably should be more than one per school. Um, for instance, I've been to two schools in Montgomery County. And the resource officer at Kennedy was actually a black female officer who was great. And the one at Einstein was a black officer. I don't know if he's still there, but he was great, too. And the thing that really stood out to me was that these resource officers particularly were really interested in engaging with the students and not just being that very strange, almost militant looking person that kind of stands and watches you and is ready to like cart you away at any moment's notice. No, they would absolutely, like they would stand around in the, um, in the cafeteria during lunch and anybody could come up to them and just, they would talk. They would absolutely, they would want to know the goings on of their students' lives. They considered themselves a part of the school just as much as anybody else. And I know that any time, you know, someone went to see the resource officer for a very serious reason, and sometimes they, I knew students who were sent for very serious reasons, um, most of the time it did not end in any sort of legal action or them being actually arrested. A lot of the time it was a a serious talk about like, hey, man, what's going on? What's why are you doing this? You know, don't do this. You know, they're going to be repercussions, but they're not going to be like detrimental to you. They're not going to affect you for the rest of your life. They probably won't even affect you for the rest of your week. And I think that's really important to highlight, to highlight that 
police in general need that community engagement. If they're if we're going to essentially say that they truly serve that community, a lot of the time what happens in the breakdown between community and police is because there's no engagement. Those cops do not know the community for which they are serving. They don't know who lives in it. They don't know who those people are. Like, your local police should be able to know you. At the very least, have seen your face enough to know, okay, I generally know who he is. I'm not afraid of him or or whoever you are, right? And I think school resource office, like the school resource officer program is a great way for local police to do that, to really get to know their own community. There are lots of other programs that are popping up that I know have been kind of in the works at the county level that are also uh, different ways to do this on more of an, uh, a one-on-one with adults. Um, there's an up-and-coming program called Coffee with a Cop, which is basically where community members come and they can just sit down and have coffee with an off-duty cop. Um, and just as a way to ask them questions about their job, their training, but also for the police officer to ask questions about whatever they don't know, whether it's you know reaching out to the queer community, which we have a very large queer community here in Montgomery County, you know whether it's reaching out to them or or you know getting specifically white officers more in touch with the black side of the community or black officers more in touch with the white side, whatever. That is just one example of police and community having a civil interaction where everybody can present their side of the story and be understanding. And I think that that's really crucial. And um, school resource officers are another, just one of those programs that allow that uh, dialogue and uh, interaction to happen. And I think it is because we have not had that much dialogue and that much interaction that we are essentially very distrustful of our own police force, which we shouldn't be. To rebuttal what you just said, um, how do you explain that Maryland has one of the highest incarceration rates for young black men? And I think you look back at it and you're labeling some students as criminals. It almost feels, I don't want to say like a prison, but you have that prison-like environment where you can see now students leaving in handcuffs, maybe not at your school, but it's happening. Um, little things now are getting reported illegally and that, that sort of track record they're labeled for the rest of their adulthood if they're 18 at something that they did in high school and you can see in the long run you get these mass incarceration rates that probably started from a young age if Maryland is leading in young black incarcerations I believe it's 21 or 18. Well I would uh, follow up with my earlier point of I think a lot of where the you know high incarceration and the tension between and the idea that you know small crimes should affect you for the rest of your life and that you could be arrested for those crimes I think that also uh, is a, is severely affected by the relationship that police have to their own community and also school resource officers are you know they are essentially a resource, they're not the solution to systemic racism, which affects the entire uh, country. Um, and Maryland is obviously not exempt from that. It, Montgomery County likes to consider itself very progressive, um, but we are deeply rooted in some very conservative ways. Like we're exceedingly redlined, very much gerrymandered, um, and we have some pretty heavy de facto segregation, which also all contribute to those things. And I would also argue that more cameras and more locked doors would emulate a more prison-like environment than more resource officers. I think it's ensuring the safety. You have no reason for a student to leave campus during school days. Um, and if they do, you have the main office that is unlocked, a parent come and gets you. Or if you're 18, you sign yourself out, you check in and out. But there's no reason to be coming in and out of the school doors. Um, there should be some a security guard at those doors. Um, they like to place them in heavily trafficked areas for protocol, but if they can have a sight of what's going on in there, because reality is, knock it down. Um, it's a scary world we're living in, but the solution doesn't have to be um, a police officer, especially when you have police stations close by. Though perhaps not as scary as we make it out to be. I know for one thing, something that we all generally complain about is perhaps, say, airport security. Now, airport security is absolutely, you know, imperative, and it's something that I'm not at all seeking to abolish, but 
I don't think I've ever heard someone not complain about how stringent airport security is for really no good reason. Uh, even though the rest of the world, the rest of the uh, you know world, especially with countries that the U.S. sees as its own peers, have had similar and more frequent attacks than the one that we've had, and they have not implemented nearly as many stringent uh, restrictions, regulations, and security protocols as the U.S. has, and they are doing just fine. And I think that we should not... We're talking about students here. We're not talking about adults who can defend themselves. When you look at it, March was the first month in however many years that there wasn't a school shooting, and that's because there were no classes. And the reality is they're coming closer and closer to us. Um, the biggest memory for me is Parkland because I lived in Florida. And what role did the school resource officer play there? It didn't save those lives. Um, we had a great example in Maryland, I want to say the, that same year, the following year, um, and they did play a huge role, but why can't we train our faculty to do that, our security guards? So, it's hard to imagine yourself in that situation, but it's a harsh reality we're living in until you're cracking down on these gun laws. Right, no, no, and though it's interesting that you bring that up of, you know, why can't we train our school security guards to do this? Well, what type of training would that involve? Are we talking about giving our school security guards guns? And if so, uh, wouldn't that essentially be making them more police officers mm -hmm. with less specific um, There's you know, protocol? For example, I've never seen my security guard with pepper spray. That's something so small. But in a time of action, it makes a huge difference. They're not going to pull. They, we should never have them pulled out on a student. But when there's an intruder, you do any measures necessary to keep your students safe. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's just a matter of questioning what's been put in place for so many years. Why do we have to keep it the same if time after time it's let us down? Um, I think that's evidence that we need to bring change, and it needs to come soon. This no. new generation is not standing by what has been going on. No, and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, my point would just be that we have to be very open and less reactionary with our you know, ideas as to what exactly should be done of this sort of all or nothing response of no, how do we curate this response specifically to the, qu to the problem at hand and make sure that we are thinking about all of the parts that go into it. But no, I wholeheartedly agree that change absolutely needs to happen. It needed to happen 200 years ago and 20 years ago, but it wasn't and, and hasn't. So now we're left with the problem. You know, for me, this, this conversation of, of SROs and um, the exchange that we just just heard from uh, from Ren and Danny really points to, uh, I think, it's just a, a really cool thought. And that is a lot of what we talk about in the conjunction or in the context of our school systems is really a microcosm for the for the conversation nationally and at large. So really what I heard, number one, uh, in that exchange was really the, the question of value, the question of relationships. If SROs are gonna add something, then sure they can come and they can be part of it. But if they're going to be there to do more of what's already wrong with policing and lock more black and brown kids up and cause more trouble and more stress, and of course we don't need more of them. Um, and I think this is part of a national conversation that we're having around defunding the police. This idea, and, and, and I, I will start off by saying I have, I have really, really close friends in the law enforcement community. So I don't think that the answer is completely defunding and abolishing the police. But I do think this is a question around, if I have a choice, if I'm a, a, a school district leader or principal and I have a choice between a school resource officer or someone in my building to address the underlying part of the underlying need for a school resource officer, folks like school psychologists or school social workers or a, a, even a media specialist that's going to help folks get excited about reading and learning. If I have a choice, I'm going to pay for one of those before I pay for a school resource officer because for me it's about value. Um, and I think that's part of the conversation that we're having. It's part of the, the, the national conversation around defunding the police. The bottom line is that spending, uh, research has shown, Department of Justice research has shown that the commensurate rate uh, that we've spent on policing in this country has not uh, gained us a corresponding decline of crime on any 
measurable line items. So we're spending here on policing and we're seeing returns down here. Any business, uh, any industry where the, ret the, the cost is here and the return is here, it's a, called a return on investment, Elijah. And any analysis after a while of decades and decades of that type of spending is going to result in some sort of action being taken to reallocate those funds. Back to the school resource issue, I think it comes back to relationships, which is again one of my core principles and tenets as, as an advocate of mentoring and youth development is that relationships are the key to, to everything. That unlocks everything else. I think we need to analyze our priorities for spending. Because again, if I have a, a choice personally between an SRO and a school psychologist or social worker, I'm, you know, I'm, going with the, I'm going with the social worker. That's just me personally. And I think that this also is, in, again, is just part of the larger conversation around how we train our officers and, and, and our, our law enforcement community in general to not see communities as threats not to see communities as, as issues to be neutralized, especially as it pertains to, as Danny noted, black and brown communities that are disproportionately policed, that are over-criminalized for simple offenses that ultimately affects everything else in that person's life, their ability to find employment, which leads to poverty, which leads to more crime. So it's all connected, and that, that's our job. It's got to be to connect the dots.